Okay, hi there, welcome to the third in our series of three videos looking at market structures. What we've done, we've chosen monopoly, oligopoly and contestable markets because they appear on the advanced information. They're really important and they're obviously highly likely to figure in the in paper one in some shape or form on Monday. And obviously we wish you well ahead of your exams. If you're joining us live on the live stream as hundreds of students are, Please do post your comments and ideas into chat. We always appreciate those. And we'll probably highlight some of the questions and points on the screens as we go through. Equally, if you're watching on replay, then pause the video whenever you like. If there's a diagram that you look like the look of or, or some examples, just pause the video and add to your revision notes. We're going to spend, if it's okay with you, about 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes max looking at contestable markets. And we're going to be focusing on what makes a market contestable, key definition. Uh, some topical examples, hopefully ones that you like, of challenger brands and uh, markets that have become more contestable. We'll definitely spend a minute or two together on sunk costs. That's a key term. I just want to make sure everybody's happy on sunk costs. Crucial distinctions between an oligopoly and a contestable market. Then we'll spend a little bit of time, a couple of minutes, on the contestable market diagram, which is important. And then we'll say something about contestable markets and efficiency. So here we go. So what is a contestable market in particular? What's a perfectly contestable market? Well, it's defined as where a new market entrant has equal access to all the production techniques available to the incumbent firms. So what we mean by that, an incumbent firm is an established existing firm that has an essentially access to technology and to market intelligence and so on. Of course, in other words, the idea is that there's a kind of level playing field for new firms coming in, which clearly isn't the case in most markets. There are barriers to entry. Also, critically, a perfectly contestable market is where entry decisions into a market can be reversed without cost. Now, that's important because that brings us on to this question. 
what are sunk costs. So sunk costs are costs that cannot be recovered in whole or in part if you're running a business and you decide to leave an industry. And obviously the higher are the sunk costs, the less contestable is the market. Maybe in the chat window, can you uh, throw in and we'll post some great answers on the screen, your good examples of sunk costs. I've got a couple for you, but uh, maybe in the chat window, what do we think uh, are examples of sunk costs? If contestable markets comes up, you need to be using this concept. So Paddy says advertising, Olivia says asset write-offs. Uh, Jocelyn says advertising spending. Ewan makes a great point about specialist machinery. That's a really good point. And Reese talks about a fire sale of unsold stock. Wow, superb. Thank you to everybody there. And Lucy talks about patents. Perhaps you might uh, lose some of the costs of protecting the trademarks and things. Excellent point. Let me just give you a couple of examples. So if you have your revision notes with you. Yeah, so fire sales. A fire sale, if you have to leave a market, there may be a sudden need to offload any unsold stock. And obviously, if you're a seller, if you have to sell, the price you're going to get is low. So typically, firms have to write off the value of stocks and assets. Uh, and I've somebody mentioned specialist material. Yes. Uh, who else? A couple of people. Rebecca mentioned specialist machinery. That's a great example. Uh, sometimes the capital employed in the business is not necessarily transferable to a new market. And again, you may have to write that off. The one on the right hand side is what's called an intangible uh, cost to leaving an industry. It's really important. If you cheese off your customers, and I choose my words carefully here, if you lose goodwill and customer loyalty, that can have a significant cost um, going uh, into new markets. People don't forget if you cheese off a customer. Good example, ITV used to operate set-top boxes, ITV Digital. They then left the market, and a lot of people were left with set-top boxes that had no value, no use. So there we go. That's some cost. That's really quite important from contestable markets. Uh, let's spend a few minutes together, if it's OK with you, on the difference between a contestable market and an oligopoly. Now, uh, I've left the right hand column blank for you as a team. So let's work through oligopoly. First of all, in an oligopoly, there's often a cluster of large dominant firms, but often many smaller ones, too. And we just did a revision session on oligopoly. A lot of students make the mistake, they say oligopoly is only a few firms. No, that's not the case. The market is dominated by some large scale firms, typically producing heavily branded products, non price competition. Yes, there are entry barriers. Yes, there are exit costs. And each firm, of course, has some pricing power, but it's also interdependent. You've got to think about the likely reaction of rivals, and indeed firms may come together in terms of collusion. Okay, let's let's have a look. People are already posting in chat, which is fantastic. So here's my first question. Post in chat if you can. How many firms are there in a contest in a highly contestable market? How many firms are there? And Eddie has come in with the best answer, fantastically. There are an infinite number of firms. Um, and let's what actually let's go through to the next slide, please, Jim, on the on the production side. The key point I've put in red here. What I'm trying to do in this session is just really highlight what matters for you for the exam. In a contestable market, there is no set numbers of suppliers. In fact, let me be even firmer. There can just be one firm in a contestable market. I know what you're thinking, Jeff, what have you been drinking? There can be one firm in a contestable market. It doesn't matter how many firms there are. What matters is actual competition and the threat of competition in a contestable market. The similarity with oligopoly is they produce branded products, that's key. But in a contestable market, the entry barriers are low, and so too are the exit costs. We assume no sunk costs. Each firm has pricing power, but crucial point, I put it in red and bold, each firm is influenced by the threat of actual and hit and run competition. Hit and run competition is where a firm comes into the market, often short term to try and take advantage of, of super normal profits and uh, they may or may not be successful okay so back to you in chat and i'm going to pause uh, my discussion here and here's the next slide what examples would you use for contestable markets let's see what people have as examples because you've all been revising this i'm sure for the exam on monday um 
So what's the industry closest to perfect contestability? That what, you know, what are the examples? Uh, coming through, Neela says Airbnb. Uh, Matty Van, Van says smartphones, good example. Uh, Safa says the tourism industry. Abby says UK parcel companies. I like that example. We've done an industry profile on that. Medi says online retailers. Max says economics help. Well, the Max, one of our top rivals. They're brilliant at what they do. They're far better than we are. Uh, clothing market. Yes, fast fashion. Really good example. Uh, fast food. Supermarket, says Eddie, using Aldi and Lidl. Yes. Uh, secondhand car market is quite interesting. Very, very contestable. And Cole says the budget airline industry, the low cost uh, airlines. Oh, yeah. Lucy says nail bars. Wow, that's a really good example. Did I tell you, by the way, that I went to the World Manicure Championships last weekend? And it was a nail biting finish. Uh, walking tours, car washes, etc. Online influencers. Yeah, definitely a good example. Hey, those, those are amazing. Let me show you my examples if you want to add them to your notes. Here they come. I've got a whole group of them, actually, <laughs> loads of them. I just have a feeling, by the way, about one or two of these in terms of the exam. I'm not, I'm not trying to question pot, spot here, but, but food retailing is our go-to example, isn't it, for all these market structures. Aldi and Little, the German discounters. Sports nutrition, quite a few businesses trying to break into that market. Some of you will have heard of Huel, which is a kind of British sports nutrition business that's doing pretty well. Uh, my favorite is the craft beer and the gin market. So many smaller producers trying to find a, a space in the market for craft beers or you know bespoke gins. Hey, the one on the top right is probably my favorite example from an exam perspective. I'm not saying this, but the food delivery business. Hello Fresh, Deliveroo, Just Eat. Uh, get here. Loads and loads of businesses trying to break into the market. Ocado, obviously, and others, and Domino's. Which of them will succeed? We're going to find out. And then another set. By the way, if people say, did I get my nails done there? Uh, no, I didn't, uh, sadly. Uh, shaving products. Yeah, Gillette dominates the shaving industry. Uh, they have something like seven of the top brands in terms of, of uh, shaving razors. But things like Dollar Shave Club or Harry's Shaves, that kind of stuff coming to the market. Uh, the sportswear is a really good example. Dominated obviously by Nike and Adidas Under Armour. But now Gymshark in the UK is, is breaking through. Retail energy, again, energy, a lot of, people, a lot of students think that's going to be a feature on, on Monday. They, they liberalised the market. Lots of smaller energy companies came into the market, uh, many of whom have now gone to the wall. And Monzo, Revolu, Starling. How many of you have got a Revolu card or a Monzo card? Really interesting on the financial services. There we go. Okay, so those are some examples of contestable markets. Just wanted to say something about a challenger brand. If you get a question on Monday on contestable markets, try to mention challenger brands. So a challenger brand is basically a product that comes into a, a market where there's a lot of big players. You know, you're competing in the land of the giants. So I just mentioned banking, RBS, Barclays, etc., Halifax, banking group, the big players. But now under threat to a degree from Metro Bank, Revolu and Monzo, the digital only banks. It's really quite interesting. If you get a question on rail services, uh, LNER has the monopoly franchise on the East Coast line from London Kings Cross all the way to Aberdeen. But now Grand Central and Luma Trains, was it Luma or Luma? I may have made a mistake there, but they are companies that are what's called access operators. They find the little gaps in the timetable and compete with LNER quite successfully. In the drinks industry, the big players, the big brewers like Heineken, Diageo, now up against these craft beer makers. The energy sector, the big six, have come under threat from the likes of Ovo Energy, which is now being bought by SSE. First Utility, which is now being bought by Shell. And Bulb Energy, which has gone bust, or went bust, and was bought, saved by the government. And there's the sportswear example, Nike, and Adidas. Under Armour, by the way, was a challenger brand until about 10 years ago. Gymshark is a great example of a challenger brand. Okay, hopefully that's useful. That's giving you some application for the exam. Uh, if I'm asked at a dinner party, as I often ask, you know, what is the key about a contestable market? This is what I always say. In a contestable market, it's not, and, and let me emphasize this, it's not the number of firms that's important. 
What matters is the ease by which new firms can come into the market. And in a highly contestable market, there was always at least the threat of a hit and run entry from a challenger brand affecting one or more parts of the market. That is absolutely key. Okay, so moving on. Let's quickly, it's okay with you, just spend two minutes on the diagram. So monopoly, oligopoly, all these diagrams that you have to do for the exam on Monday. Um, I mean, once you, if you can smash the narrowly diagrams, you are in great shape, I think, on Monday. So here's our contestable market. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be, for the sake of argument, it could be uh, the leisure wear sector, or it could be the market for craft ales. It doesn't matter. A profit maximizing firm without the threat of entry can price at P1, and the output is C1, and therefore, of course, they can make, they can make some profit. Uh, that's, the, that's the profit maximizing output. However, uh, they don't have to price there. Uh, they could, if they were growth maximizer, let's move to the next slide. If they were a growth maximizer, trying to maximize their market share in a contestable market, uh, they might price at P2. That's where average cost meets average revenue. Can you see that output Q2? And that's the price where normal profit is made. So the question is often asked, well, what is the price in a contestable market? And the answer is it depends. It depends on the threat of competition. If the threat of competition is high, then firms are more likely to price closer to P2, sacrifice some profit to avoid um, losing market share. If the threat of competition is genuinely low, you're more likely to be able to price close to the profit maximizing output. Now that is your contestable market diagram. There's nothing more to it than that. If you, if you can use that diagram in the exam, you will be in great shape. A couple of things to finish with. Thank you for your time, by the way. We're going to try and keep this under 20 minutes because all of you have huge pressures on the time. I'm very conscious of that. So uh, efficiency. Just said to my students, literally 10 minutes ago, I had, I had a revision session with them. And I said to them this, you, in paper one on Monday, you absolutely have to be talking about welfare and efficiency, at, certainly in the 25 mark questions. Uh, the essay questions are nearly always in the data response. Okay, so is a contestable market efficient? Well, and the answer is probably yes, actually. If the threat of entry is high, firms tend to price low, and that will improve allocative efficiency. And you can show the consumer surplus. As I said to you, if you followed the monopoly diagram, try to draw the, uh, try to draw the demand curve to the y-axis, uh, to show consumer surplus. Actually, if you just go back a slide, Jim, please, on the production side, what I've done here is I haven't quite drawn the demand curve to the y-axis. If I had my time again to draw this diagram, I would, because then that allows me to show more easily the consumer surplus, if that makes sense. So back to the next slide. So in theory, contestable markets are good for allocative efficiency. Secondly, if you have actual and the threat of competition, of course, there's a lot of pressure on firms to keep their costs under control because otherwise other firms are going to take your market. So you get less X inefficiency, you get more X efficiency. In this kind of market, innovation is huge. It's really important. Process innovation, business models, manufacturing models, as well as product innovation, it's really important. So typically you get a lot of product innovation in contestable markets. So that's good for dynamic efficiency. And you can have any number of firms in the market. So you can have one, two, three firms in the market. As long as it's the threat of entry, those firms can and do exist. And that uh, leaves you the big scope for scale economy. So overall, I think contestant markets are normally pretty good in terms of all three types of efficiency. Uh, Safa says, well, wouldn't they lack abnormal profits for dynamic efficiency if, if it's highly contestable? I think you're right. That's a great point. But uh, you can make profits in the contestable market. You can make profits. The key is whether or not there is the threat of hit and run entry. And uh, there are obviously some barriers to that. That's why no market is perfectly contestable. My final slide uh, is this one. I just want to say four points about evaluation, try and give you a bit of an A star perspective. Um, the question is, could this come up as a 25 marker? Too right, it can. In fact, the exam boards love contestable markets because they're really, they, you can really get stuck into the applied side, can't you? So let me finish off with four very short points. 
first of all, I think most markets, most industries are contestable to some degree, even in the case of a natural monopoly. Look, I know what you're saying, Jeff, again, what have you been doing? <laughs> How can you have a natural monopoly that's contestable? Let me explain. So the water industry and the rail network and the telecoms infrastructure are probably good examples of natural monopolies. And I accept that, you know, you don't want two sets of water pipes into your house. You don't want three sets of rail lines into every platform, etc. So networks tend to be natural monopolies, but often it's the final mile competition, the way you can get the, you can get the contestability. So the next top right goes with this point. Contestability often comes with final mile services. So for example, BT has to allow Talk Talk and Sky to put their equipment into their network so they can offer services to consumers. Um, now in the water industry, if you look at my water industry profile video, um, there are now businesses providing water services to businesses. That's breaking, creating some competition. So often even in a natural monopoly, there are parts of the industry where there's contestability. So Luma Trains and Grand Central competing with LNER on one network. Bottom left point, penultimate point, yes, technological advances are definitely helping to make markets more contestable. They're bringing down the barriers to entry. Loads of businesses are now starting and accumulating sales and users and customers using existing e-commerce platforms. So Tutor to You, for example, God bless it, is now selling its products on Amazon and, um, you know, because it's a tremendous platform to do that. But on the other hand, I will finish with this point. Although lots of markets are becoming more contestable, a lot of economists really worried about so-called platform businesses, Netflix, I don't know, it's, it's competing with Disney Plus and Amazon, Amazon Prime, obviously, but the likes of Amazon and Facebook and Google, uh, perhaps those, even Netflix, they're such huge platform businesses with enormous economies of scale there is a slight danger that it's becoming harder for new firms to come in and take their place. You know, there will always probably be an Amazon out there. There'll always probably be a, a Google. It's very hard to see a rival getting to that kind of scale, certainly in the immediate horizon. So there's a lot of evaluation here. Hopefully there's some, some of the examples we've been through uh, could, uh, could help you in your paper. We're up to 19 minutes on the video. I wanted to keep it to 20. So that gives me a minute to answer any questions and Jim in the production office will pick up some questions if they uh, come through. Hannah says, any last minute revision tips? Yes, Hannah, practice timed writing over the weekend, five marks, eight marks, whatever it is, just keep writing. Oh, Ria says, as technology is making all marks more contestable, could we mention it? Because it's not making specific industries more contestable. I think that's a good point. Everything is contextual, isn't it? So choose an industry where technology is making it easier for small firms to come in choose an industry where technology is actually reinforcing the monopoly power of the, of the established players. So uh, that, that's, that would be my answer to that question. Let's see what comes up briefly on the final little bit. Uh, oh, sorry, Daisy says, I'm still confused as to how a natural monopoly could be contestable. Um, and I'll come to George's question in a second. Okay, to, so to answer um, uh, uh, Daisy's question, how can a natural monopoly be contestable? So what I'm saying there, Daisy, is that the network itself I think that the rail network and all the water pipes and the sewage systems, et cetera, and the BT infrastructure, that is essentially a natural monopoly. But the final bit of the service can become competitive. So, so for example, Sky and Talk Talk, they have access to BT's network. And then that allows them to provide services that compete with BT. So you get a bit of competition at the final mile. And that's, that's how you get a bit of competition, not across the whole industry, but at, at the final bit of the service. Great question from George, which Jim has put on the screen here. What would you say are the best things to say when talking about for government increasing contestability? SMEs promotion, yes. Uh, encouraging enterprise culture is huge. Deregulation. So for example, the parcel industry was deregulated 10, 15 years ago. Free trade, we mentioned this yesterday, opening up markets to trade. Uh, basically as a way of, of letting sunlight into industries because firms have to compete with international as well as domestic firms. So trade, market liberalization would be key. And also I think competition policy, blocking those mega mergers that really block the opportunities for smaller firms to come in.
Audrey, Audrey says um, competitive tendering. Really good example there at the level of public services. And Alice asked this question, could we talk about creative destruction? Well, thank you for asking that question, Alice. Joseph Schumpeter is one of my economic heroes, the Austrian school. In contestable markets, there's often the challenge of the new, disruptive businesses with different models, different products, different mindsets. And uh, that is powerful for dynamic efficiency. So great question there. And maybe one more. Rhys asks, do you see no need for the perfectly competitive market diagram? Well, Rhys, it's not on the advanced information in my board at Excel, uh, so I wouldn't be using it. And uh, even if there was no advanced information, I wouldn't be using it. I think you should be talking about, unless it says perfect competition in the question, I think you should be using contestable market diagrams. We'll pause there because I've taken up 20 minutes of your time. Uh, I hope hopefully, hopefully useful. If you enjoyed it, it's great if you give us a thumbs up. On YouTube that sends a message to the rest of the internet that it was a useful video just want to say I might do a few over the weekend I'll do some short topic videos of the weekend but I just want to say enormous good luck to everybody you've worked so hard for this paper you've been through so much I think you'll do tremendously well if you keep a steady steady focus stay calm stay happy stay positive see the other side take care